back, everyone. I think there were a lot of great conversations going on over the intermission. I interrupted a few by telling you to go back to your seats. <laughs> I also interrupted a few by telling the candidates to go out of the room, so I apologize for that. I hope you still got a chance to, to converse with them a little bit and converse with some of the other attendees. So we're now moving to the, the heart of our event. It's the moderated forum with our candidates. And Greg Hart is going to lead us in the moderation. So Greg has a formal background in ergonomics and kinesiology. He can tell you exactly why sitting is one of the most dangerous things you could ever do. <laughs> His work and research in ergonomics led to a fascination around, around the gulf between explicit and implicit behavior and how the effects are felt in the world. Thinking is one of those behaviors, and he undertook a deep study of critical thinking and skepticism, including attending the Academy of Critical Thinking at Sonoma State University in California. Greg is a regular presenter at the International Conference on Critical Thinking. He is the board chair of Make It Good, a Calgary-based organization concerned with creating a space for a critical dialogue aimed at building resilient communities. He works with organizations to help them employ critical thinking in their activities, and is working on a book about the dangerous paradox that surrounds the feeling of being safe. When he wants to re relax, he referees professional lacrosse. <laughs> Welcome, Greg. That's the key qualification for tonight's activity, is that I'm a professional referee. <laughs> Truly, it's a Zen experience to go somewhere and have 18,000 people all chanting your name. It's, it's, uh, it's a thrilling thing. Uh, and they're so happy to see me all the time. So uh, I, I have a good, strong connection with people who are throwing themselves into the political maw, because uh, it's a similar kind of feeling, I think, at times. So I just want to give you a bit of a feel for what we're going to do here in the next hour or so. And that is that we're going we're gonna to move away from the way that a lot of campaign-focused activity works, which is where everybody starts to talk about issues, and they get to trade points with each other about how they disagree on all these fine points of the different issues. We are, as a matter of fact, going to ignore the issues almost entirely tonight, if not completely. What we're more interested in doing is exposing the logic of the candidates themselves in terms of how they think and how they approach the work that they do or life in general. Now, most of what's going to happen here is that we've put together some questions in advance that we're going to put to the candidates. And we've also collected some from you fine folks out there sitting in those chairs, which are ever so bad for you. And, uh, and then we're just going to let it rip, basically. And we're, we're going to go through here, and we're going to see uh, what everybody has to say. And it's going to be interesting for sure. I, I just wanted to start because you know some point, sometimes when I mention this idea that, well, we, we're not going to talk about issues, I, I thought I'd share uh, a quote that is useful because it's from Cicero and it's from 55 BC, just you know, the other day. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> sometimes it does feel like just the other day. Uh, the budget should be balanced. The treasury should be refilled. Public debt should be reduced. The arrogance of officialdom should be tempered and controlled, and the assistance to foreign lands should be curtailed lest Rome become bankrupt. People must again learn to work instead of living on public assistance. So that's from 55 BC, and I share that with you as a way of rendering moot the discussion of issues because it's clear that nothing has changed in the intervening <laughs> 2,055 years. <laughs> That's true. There were no bike lanes in Rome at that time. <laughs> That's true. Don't even get me started on bike lanes. That's uh, so. Uh, so anyway, that's what we're looking for. We're looking at the explicit thinking of these people, and we're going to see what happens because, as was mentioned in uh, in Michelle's presentation, that a part of a system's function is actually the actors in the system becoming more explicit about knowing what they are contributing and what their impacts actually are. So often we jump right past understanding these things and get right into just making judgments on things, often from assumptions we're not examining, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we're going to go. So we're going to start with a really easy question, I think, and, um, and then we're going to go from there. So um, usually I have the cards and I just shuffle them and decide who's going to be 
first, but I'm going to start in the middle, and it's going to be with George. <laughs> well, you were the first one here. That was kind of what it made me think about that. So, uh, <laughs> so that'll pay to get early. So this this is what I want to know from you is what are what are your thoughts about the role? Okay, so the role that you're getting elected to. What is the purpose of that role? What what is it there to do? Uh, well, you know, my background uh, uh, my background is uh, I worked. Uh, is a journalist for uh, a number of years, and uh, a journalist's job is to, to listen and distill, uh, to communicate, uh, and try to find the story, uh, and make, work your way through the mess and find the story and, and get to the heart of it. And I think that's a politician's job as well. It's really to listen and then find what the focus is and distill it and try to get the best answer possible to the most possible people you can do it for. Okay. Mike, you want to jump in on this? That was a very good answer, actually. I thought um, I. Um, You're allowed to agree with him if you think. It's yeah, no, I. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, can you just repeat the question again? I was sort of started thinking about what George was saying. Carry on. Uh, no, with just the, what you think the purpose of uh, the role that you're trying to get elected for. What is the purpose of that role? Um, I think I I believe that it is to try and. Uh, it, to, to take in those inputs and and try and and, and make uh, good use good judgment and um, and try and to, to deal with the complexities of of governing and try to uh, make sure that you can make the the best choice um, and uh, knowing full well that um, you're always going to be on a knife's edge of of uh, possibly making the wrong decision and uh, potentially you know ticking off a lot of voters. So so that's that edge of chaos that mm -hmm. Michelle was speaking of. A lovely place to be. Uh, Andrea, what do you think? Uh, um, well, I've had the, the, you know, the pleasure of being in elected office for two terms now, one at City Council, which I'm currently serving the end of, um, and also at the school board in Vancouver from 2002 to 2005. Very different. Um, environments if anyone wants to talk about that um, but also when I was on the school board I was still working as the executive director of the Western Canada Wilderness Committee throughout that experience so I had this odd experience of during the day um, working very hard in advocacy to change the minds of provincially elected officials or federally elected officials and then at night sitting in a chair sorry Greg um, where people were coming to change my mind about something related to the school system so did it, it gave me such an opportunity to reflect on the the activities are not um, exclusive. They are part of a spectrum of our democratic engagement. So you can choose to represent yourself as an advocate, um, but you can also, as advocates, we choose people to represent us at those tables. Hopefully, I, I, there's some ambivalent relationships with power between advocacy and elected office, but um, if you can reconcile those, ultimately your job is to represent people in a representative democracy. I don't think of us as being an expert driven. I don't think you're trying to elect the smartest person or the you know, the most knowledgeable person, you're trying to elect the person who can best represent you. And that isn't because they look like you or share your experience, although that certainly helps. And part of why I got in politics was not a lot of people looked like me when I was elected at 30 as a woman into politics. Um, but also because they take the time to organize in community and develop leaders who can then be advocates on issues that really matter. Because even the smartest 11 people in the world could not solve all the problems in community. So if we're not, as elected officials, supporting the development of leadership in our communities, then we're not really serving our communities the way that we're being elected to serve our communities. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ellen. Part of what I'm hearing here, kind of coming up repeatedly, is this idea of, uh, well, there's a sort of concept of inquiry and advocacy kind of emerging a little bit. And then the other thing that, uh, that I'm hearing is this idea that supposed to listen to what's going on, figure out what's happening, take what might be the best possible decision, even given that 11 of the smartest people might not always get exactly the thing right. When it comes to selling that best decision, uh, how does that mesh with the logic of politics in that people would say, some people would say the logic of politics is power. Uh, how do I get it? How do I keep it? Uh, and that maybe saying something unpopular, even if you believe it's the best thing, could be a difficult situation. What's your thought on that? 
Well, I think people get involved with all kinds of different politics. I mean, and people at in the city of Vancouver have uh, an array of political parties that they can en engage with and run with. I mean, there's there's the NPA represented here. There's uh, Vision represented. There's Cope represented. Neighborhood Sustainable Vancouver represented, and Sandy's running as an independent. And I think you find each of those po parties think about politics in a different way. Cope the, is the party that I ran with, and because it reflected my values. A when I first ran with them, it's a 40-year-old party. We don't take corporate donations. Uh, we come from an activist base. We work with social movements and issues. I've been standing and supporting Occupy Vancouver. Um, and I was an organizer in the downtown east side in the SROs before I was elected. So very much uh, came out of an activist, community organizer, strengthening neighborhoods base uh, standing up against the big developers trying to talk about how to democratize so when I come into this situation I'm listening to people I'm working with people and I'm thinking about how to share power with people and get people to see City Hall as as their vehicle to make change and perhaps lobby other levels of government like the support we gave to Insight um, tackling the federal government around safe injection sites Sandy, what do you think about this conflict between uh, advocating for something that could, uh, would be an unpopular thing, but something that uh, you would feel really strongly was the best possible solution? Now that's a different question. I know. <laughs> so we're, so, we're, so we're, we're moving along. We're moving, we're moving right. along. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that ultimately it is really the essence of uh, government, isn't it? I mean, at, at, its, at its core, um, good government is about principles, and it's about character uh, more than it is about particular policies. And I, I look at, at the situation that we're facing today uh, just a few blocks from here, in fact, a block and a half from here, or a block from here, and um, what this really is forcing us as a community, as a society, to confront and, and how, how we grapple with it. And, and it's the exercise of power. Um, so my sense is, as someone who has, you know, I've worked in the criminal justice system, um, I have <coughs> been both a weak person in society and a strong person in society and I understand the difference in how the difference in power and how how it, it um, is expressed in the community and government ultimately um, is the seat of power and it's very important that that be that that that, that power be exercised with uh, great thought and care and principle Okay, Nicole. Same question? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me think. Uh, yeah, basically the same question, which is how far, uh, how far would you be willing to go to advocate for the thing that you've determined through your best instincts and processes to be the right thing to do, even though it might be wildly unpopular amongst your constituents? Well, I think there's certain uh, universal human rights and universal uh, m social justice issues that we have to adhere to as a society in order to ensure that everybody has a healthy and, um, and, and uh, productive life. And uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I've gotten involved in politics. I'm not a kind of person to stand down when I believe that uh, any kind of rights are being, um, being imposed upon in a negative way. And I mean, that's why I'm running with Neighborhoods for Sustainable Vancouver. We're really trying to advocate for getting corporate funding out of politics because I don't think that's fair to the people of Vancouver. I think we all deserve a voice, and that's not something that I'm willing to stand down on. Um, so that's something that I'm living right now, and I would continue to do so. I know that you know sometimes, for example, uh, processes that we might need to take or actions that we might need to take to save the environment, for example, might not be convenient for everybody. 
but I think that there are things that we need to do in order to save our planet and to, in order to ensure that we have a happy and healthy society, and I personally wouldn't back down on that even if I was a politician. All right, thanks. Mike, is there a way to take these situations where it's there might be a best interest but that it's unpopular? Is there Are there things that can be done to help bridge that gap, to bring people along so that it becomes less unpopular? What are your thoughts on that? Well, if I think we're being in intellectually honest about this, all politicians... I, I, hope, I hope so. <laughs> if, uh, all politicians will recoil uh, from... Uh, public opposition. They will make compromises. They will look at the possible, the, uh, they will crawl under a rock if you have to, because sometimes that's what happens. And it really, uh, uh, you know, the fact is, is that um, uh, a successful politician is not somebody who gets themselves booted out of office right away based upon one matter of principle. There are probably, over the long term, ways of achieving the goals uh, uh, the ways of, of moving things forward in, in your eyes of, of how you want to govern the, uh, your jurisdiction uh, that maybe take um, a bit of give and take. It's not sort of heading in one uh, direction at all times. It's, um, uh, it is making compromises along the way. I, you know, in order to achieve um, uh, what you perceive as uh, positive change, you need a, a measure of political capital. And I, I'm just trying to think of one uh, potentially extremely unpopular uh, uh, policy that, that came forward recently that s somehow managed to go ahead. And I'm, I'm going to be accused of being too much of a center-right guy here, but I'm thinking of the, the carbon tax. Oh, let's check it down here. Uh, the carbon tax in, in, in British Columbia and how that came about. It was a uh, effectively it had a, a very mobilized opposition to it. It was going to be killed, really, by, um, uh, in, in the case of this one, by, um, uh, you know, Bill Tillman and the NDP. And Bill's a great politico. He, I have a heck of a lot of respect for him. I have lunch with him occasionally. Um, uh, but he really capitalized on the, the discontent around gas taxes. You know, and this was coming out when I think we're, we were paying $1.50 a liter. And, um, and somehow the public ended up understanding that and, and buying into it. And in fact, Gordon Campbell won another election with that as an election issue. So that's one of these kind of good things that can happen if you if you play your cards smart. Um, and um, I just use that. I just find that as an inter interesting example because uh, politics um, and you know Andrea and, and, and Ellen in their current government have done some good things. I know that they've had to make compromises along the way. If I get elected, I'm going to be in the very same situation. But I am going to be mo motivated with the ultimate goal of hopefully getting uh, getting some good things um, uh, underway in the city. And uh, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Sandy, uh, your thoughts on the, the idea that uh, basically what he's saying is that, I think, is that you could um, blow all of the power that you accumulate by being elected if you pick a fight in the wrong place and then ultimately you're not going to be able to get anything done uh, down the road because something so unpopular has happened you know, early in the process. Do you think that there, what would you do if you confronted uh, something that where people were disagreeing with you quite significantly, uh, had a different argument, what's your reaction to that situation? How do you handle something like that? Well, I think a lot of it depends on the nature of the issue and what's, what's at stake. Um, I like to think uh, that I, my approach to issues is around soft power. This is uh, something that we're seeing more and more of. Nahed Nenshi is an expert practitioner of soft power, which is the power of attraction, and being able to become very persuasive and not to um, get pulled into taking hardline positions, but rather to be persuasive. We did this, um, I, I spearheaded the, the uh, Vancouver Not Vegas coalition that, that uh, uh, was a grassroots citizens coalition that, that opposed the expansion of the uh, Edgewater Casino at BC Place Stadium. And when we started, there was, 
there was a great deal of silence, actually public silence. And in fact, one of the most concerning things around that issue was the extent to which uh, people in significant positions of power uh, were reluctant to say anything because they were afraid that it would have a negative impact on their careers, on their businesses. There was a lot of silencing that went on in the community around this. Uh, we worked very, very hard to uh, unite a range of citizens from across the entire city and really build strength through attraction. And, th and people really respect that. Uh, ultimately, people sense strength and they're attracted to it. So my feeling is that it, it's not, it's rarely necessary to take a hardline position, even on a question of principle where internally you know you are not going to bend, but you work with people. Okay. George, how about you? When you uh, encounter fierce opposition to something that you are fairly convinced uh, is, is the right thing to do? Uh, well, for me, um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I have a, a marketing agency in Vancouver, and uh, it's one of my biggest challenges I'm going to have in office when I win, of course, uh, which is on November 19th, uh, will be uh, the fact that currently I have, uh, it's my business. I'm 100% of it. I get to decide the path of the business. I get to decide the goals of the business, the business plan, the budgeting. I have you know, complete control, and I, I like it. Um, but, but I understand that you can't do that in politics, and you can't do that in office, and, and, and it's important uh, to know that. However, uh, I think that with my background in, and especially since I'm a marketer, uh, my perspective sometimes is, uh, is, is slightly salesy, perhaps. And, and if I think there's an issue that is perhaps going to have some sort of backlash, but I think it's, it's good medicine that people people need this. We somehow, there's a reason for that. Well, however we got there as politicians, we've decided that perhaps this is a, something that needs to be done. Then from, from my experience, then it becomes a sales job. And uh, you really have to find a way to make people, you know, understand why it's good. And, uh, you know, and that's, it, I don't know if that's, can be considered sleazy. I don't think so. If it's something you actually believe in. Uh, but you really have to find a way to communicate it to, to everybody. Because, Sometimes something is good for uh, the people, and the counter uh, argument being pushed and sold uh, may not be good. And and I think Mike alluded to it, the carbon tax. I mean, uh, I think that's sort of a similar thing. You've got everybody, you know, sort of saying it's a bad thing, and, and you know, it, the message gets confused. And 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 HST is another one. I mean, it really becomes a marketing exercise, and both sides think they're right. And so you know, it's going to be interesting when I'm in there. And, it's an interesting mention about as soon as you say the word sales, it starts to feel a little bit. Uh, 